Hi, my name is Margie DeMonte, and I'm with ACMI-TV, your local broadcast station here in Arlington. I am hosting a five-part series on sustainable living, which will focus on such topics as food, water, housing, and economics. In today's show, we will learn about a drought-resistant tree, the Moringa tree, um, often, often referred to as nature's medicine cabinet and how it is being used in Tanzania for the cure of malnutrition and the purification of water. I first learned about the Moringa tree while watching Nicole Samarco's show, Nicole's Review, on ACMI-TV. She had on two high school students, also brothers, Ishan and Suvan Shukla, both demonstrating the many benefits of the Moringa tree. My interest in learning about this tree led me to Nicole and asking her how I could find out more about it. Nicole introduced me to Ardi Shukla, the mother of Ishan and Suvan, and who is also a mechanical engineer herself with Engineers Without Borders. So she referred me to my guest speaker, Richard Maturana, who, who is one of the leaders of the project in Tanzania with Engineers Without Borders. So let me give you a little background information on Mr. Maturana. He is a mechanical engineer, a retiree of Draper Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He retired as a distinguished member of technical staff, having contributed to and led many diverse projects for Navy Strategic Systems, NASA, DAPA, and Homeland Security. Mr. Maturana holds engineering degrees from Columbia University and MIT an MBA from Northeastern University, and is a graduate of Harvard Business School's Program for Management Development. I am very pleased to have Mr. Maturana as my guest to learn about the project being done in Tanzania and how the many benefits of the Moringa tree is helping the villages there. I'm so pleased to have you here, Mr. Maturana, on my show today. Well, thank you, Margie, and many thanks to ACMI for giving me this opportunity to tell uh, the community about the Moringa tree and a little bit about the good work that Engineers Without Borders is doing. Why don't we start <coughs> and I'll ask you some questions and actually you have, we have a PowerPoint to, yep. um, to help with us so we can actually start the, with the questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so can you please tell us what Engineers Without Borders is all about? Uh, this is an organization that is uh, uh, about 15 years old now. Uh, the objective of EWB is to improve people's lives by providing free technical and management resources uh, for small infrastructure projects, and it's usually uh, for delivering clean water. Uh, today we have about 16,000 members. Most technical colleges have student chapters. Uh, there are a total of 275 chapters, including professional chapters, all over the country and a few in Europe now. Uh, I am a member of the Boston professional chapter. <laughs> okay. And we have relationships with the Harvard chapter, the MIT chapter, where we do joint programs. Uh, my program, my primary program, is in Tanzania. Uh, where we'll talk about the uh, Moringa project, but the Boston chapter also now has projects in Honduras, uh, Colombia, and, and Costa Rica. Wow, okay. that's a lot, a lot of projects going on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you tell us how you got involved with this? With Actually, I got involved uh, at my daughter's urging when she could see me <laughs> Uh, approaching retirement age, and she majored in international relations. She's now uh, working for the Red Cross in the Operations Center in Washington, D.C., oh. and she had heard about the good work that EWB is, uh, is doing. So she felt it was a good match, and uh, I like to travel. I, like, I have a reasonable history in program management. And even though I'm not a civil engineer, uh, the work I'm doing in small business development and microloans seems to be a very good fit. Okay, great. Um, so what are some of the projects that you are involved with? 
Let me start with uh, Tanzania, where we've been working for about uh, five or six years. The program centers, like most EWB programs, around delivering clean water. And let me tell you generally some principles about how EWB works. Uh, we first network with other NGOs, non-governmental organizations, that specialize uh, in other areas, such as community development, where we furnish uh, engineering expertise and project management expertise. We make a long-term commitment to a community, five mm -hmm. years. Okay. Five years. Five years. Uh, this is not an organization that just flies in, does something great and wonderful, and flies away. Mm -hmm. When we leave, we make sure that the project is well managed, the people understand uh, how to operate the equipment, that it's funded, etc., for the long term, and then we revisit the site uh, in subsequent years to make sure everything is going to plan. We work very closely with the communities to get their buy-in, to make sure we understand their needs, and then review alternatives, engineering alternatives with them on assessment trips prior to doing any work at all uh, before we actually uh, do the work. So they understand what's going to happen. Uh, they contribute their labor. They contribute uh, yeah. a small amount of funding. and. Uh, and it's been very successful. We don't do the project for them. <laughs> we don't give them the money to do it themselves. Uh, when, if there is any evidence of corruption, uh, we make sure that uh, we avoid it. Okay, um, but that's good to know that you don't that you you are there for a, a good five years because I could see you know, training that, that they're not learning the, the project correctly, that they're not implementing all of that's going on. And I think five years gives them enough time to pretty much un understand what's going on there. Can you tell me about the Moringa seed and its benefits for water purification? Can I tell you a little bit more about the Tanzania project before we get into, into the Moringa? Sure. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, the Tanzania program, uh, is very village-based. We work in three villages in central Tanzania, where it's very poor, subsistence, mostly subsistence farmers, and very dry. Uh, we have village meetings uh, at every opportunity to make sure that the villagers understand what uh, uh, the opportunities are, and we understand their needs. In central Tanzania, this is very typical of of where people get their water in contaminated rivers, okay? <coughs> uh, we usually have enough money to go to uh, Tanzania uh, maybe twice per year, so we have to make sure that the money is spent very well and, uh, and very efficiently. Another alternative for getting water, and this is changing very quickly with progress that we've made in a pumping system, is the villagers will just dig shallow wells and they'll take the water, which is muddy and dirty, out of that. And uh, it's uh, often the cause of uh, diarrheal diseases. Mm. Okay. One of the projects we did in our Tanzanian village is a water catchment system uh, with a little chlorination catching water off the roof. It, it worked, but clearly it wasn't enough. And in another village where there is uh, a water system, we are doing a lot of repairs. But this is typically what you'll see at the end of a successful project, a, uh, a distribution stand. And the people will line up and then carry the water away. They will pay a few cents per liter for water and then carry it back to their houses. Uh, in the village of Muktani, we had a big success last year where we raised enough money to drill a deep well. And we discovered clean water at about 120 meters. Uh, and this was the cause of great celebration. Uh, in fact, two goats were slaughtered in our honor, not one. Uh, <laughs> two goats. <laughs> and this is the temporary pump that we put in 
and we're going back in uh, just a few weeks to put in a permanent uh, uh, electrical pump with a generator. Uh, this is what a latrine looks like. It's very typical of what school children use. Uh, mm. We're building latrines there and we have an alliance with the Harvard student chapter to build a schoolhouse. Mm. Uh, it's been done. In fact, we reviewed it last night and the Harvard student chapter did a fantastic job. Oh, that's so now they could attract teachers and keep them yeah. because they have good facilities. Fantastic. Uh, if we could find out about how the uh, Moringa seed is being used, and I know that this is one, mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the water treatments that we're going to be talking about here. So given the conditions of poverty in central Tanzania, water purification uh, that's economical and easy is extremely important. Uh, several methods are most common. One of them called SOTUS, solar disinfectant. Solar disinfection uh, is very easy and very inexpensive, basically, and I have more details about this later. You just put the water in a in a bottle, a clear plastic bottle of maybe no more than three liters. The water can't be too cloudy, but the UV rays uh, will kill about 90% of the bacteria, which is a very good start. Uh, boiling is not very good because the women have to gather sticks uh, and it's very dry and there isn't much wood in the area and they'd rather use that to cook dinner. Chlorination works 100% well, but the villagers just can't afford the chlorination tablets. A uh, little bit about the SOTUS. Again, stands for solar disinfection. When you put the water in a bottle, uh, it should be reasonably clear. Uh, there's a little test for that. If you put the water in a two or three liter bottle and put it on top of a, a newspaper front page. If you could see and read the, the big letters, it's clear enough to allow the sunlight to go through to penetrate, to, to kill the bacteria. Put it in the sunlight for about six hours, two days or more if the sky is cloudy. And uh, one could use Moringa powder as the first step to get the water to the required level of clarification. So let's get into Moringa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a full-grown Moringa tree. <laughs> Moringa uh, oleifera is one of 13 varieties. It's the most prevalent variety, the most useful variety. It gets to be about uh, maybe 20 feet high at full uh, growth after perhaps three years. The great benefit of the Moringa is uh, the nutritional value of the leaves, the nutritional value of the beans, and the economic value of the beans. The beans contain an oil which is very valuable on the world market. Uh, but we're most interested in the nutritional value of, uh, of the leaves for the, for the villagers. We're helping them to start a uh, series of Moringa farms, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Okay. But first, like I said, the nutritional value of, mm -hmm. of the Moringa is uh, most important. It has multiple times the number of vitamins of, of common foods, two and a half times, excuse me, 25 times the uh, iron and spinach, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the leaves, if you dry them in the sun, uh, excuse me, dry them, but not in the sun. <laughs> okay, stand corrected, not in the sun, okay. Uh, and then put them in a, uh, a clean jar in, in the shade. Uh, one can crush them and give them to a child. Uh, typical doses for uh, adults are something like three tablespoons per day. And 
one has to start very slowly because uh, you have to get your body accustomed to the uh, blast of nutritional uh, uh, vitamins, frankly. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I um, show them Please? some of the, uh, what I have here? This is the powder right here. You can see that this is, the, uh, this is from dried leaves. And this is what you would actually put in smoothies, or I actually use it and put it in yogurt. Um, I just do, I'm, I haven't been using it that much, so I'm using a teaspoon. I was using a, a tablespoon, but eventually I will up it more. So that's the powder. These are the seeds here, and th this is what's used to grow the mer Moringa tree right here, these are the seeds. And these, this is also for water purification, right? This, this is what, once you open the seeds up, uh, let me see if I can do this quickly. You'll see what the inside of this is. And this, if you crush this, and then you put this seed in water, that would, uh, you make a solution, and then you, that this is what uh, purifies your water. And you can actually eat these, because I've eaten these. You can actually um, pan fry them uh, like popcorn. They taste a little bit like popcorn or peanuts. Um, this is the pod in which these seeds are. These, they're huge. The pods are really huge. So this is this, the pod right here. And I'm going to show you. We have someone who actually made um, these, you know, this you can cook. This is the what she used here. She cut these into small pieces, and then she put it in a curry sauce. And you can actually put this over rice. So that's another way that you can eat the the moringa. Um, I guess that's it for showing you this. <laughs> Margie mentioned uh, water treatment with moringa powder. Uh, the method that one would use for, let's say, if you wanted to treat a five-gallon can of muddy water, uh, is to take the mature pods, you know, dry <coughs> the seeds, crush them so that they're in a powder form, and then uh, take about two to four tablespoons of the powder, add it to a small jar of water, like two cups of water, shake that for five minutes, wait a while, pour that into the five gallon can, stir that rapidly for five minutes and moderately for 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, allow that to settle for two or three hours. Basically, the Moringa powder is a coagulant, okay? It pulls out all the particulate matter and a lot of bacteria with it, okay? Uh, so in my opinion, it amounts to a very good start for a very poor uh, environment where there are very few alternatives for clean water. But if they had, um, if they had bleach, they could actually, from that, from what you have explained about using the moringa powder, and then they cleaned it as much as possible. They purified it. They didn't get off all the bacteria. But if they put in like one or two drops of household One or two bleach. drops of chlorine will do an amazing job, okay? It might taste a little funny, but it will really kill the bacteria. Okay. Okay. Uh, the problem is that for a yearly income of a subsistence farmer of <coughs> on the order of $1,500 a year, they will not do it, mm -hmm. okay? It will be very difficult to do. So on our trips there, we collect uh, clear water bottles for them. We give them the water bottles, uh, teach them uh, through leaflets and Swahili and <coughs> uh, lectures uh, to, uh, to use the sodas. Mm -hmm. okay. And okay. It's, slowly, it's slowly catching on, but it is slow. Yeah. I, I mean, I see the, the value for here, or for anywhere, I mean, actually, for using the system. Um, for instance, like in Puerto Rico, what's going on there, if they don't have, you know, they can't boil the water because they don't have electricity. So um, they could use this if the water is really, really uh, dirty and, you know, 
has to be purified, they could start with the moringa seed, and then from there they could use a you know a household unscented bleach yeah, and just and place you know, clean like it from Puerto Rico. They probably have some bleach, mm -hmm. and uh, or so if I were camping and I didn't have confidence in the water that was available, I would put some of it in a clear plastic bottle and expose it to sunlight. Mm -hmm. And soda should take care of it. Uh, more about the nutritional value of Moringa uh, and where the Moringa tree thrives. If you look at a map uh, <coughs> where there's malnutrition and semi-arid areas, they're absolutely congruent. Okay? One falls right on top of another, which makes it perfectly appropriate. I, I love Mother Nature for that one reason. <laughs> it really is there to help us. <laughs> uh, this was us on a recent trip to Tanzania, uh, a totally uncared for moringa tree uh, by the side of the road. And note how the soil is extremely dry. The uh, moringa powder, as we said, is, is highly nutritious. It's, it's been adopted as one of the go-to foods for famine for the uh, World Health Organization. Uh, many good recipes uh, can be found in a book by Sanford Holst mm -hmm. called Moringa, Nature's Medicine Cabinet. And I also want to mention that a, a lot of the data and material that I'm quoting comes from the Strong Harvest Peer Educator Manual. Strong Harvest International is an organization that ha is devoted to uh, spreading the benefits of Moringa throughout the world, and they do a fantastic job, Rick Kemmer and his wife. Okay. And I've actually, I've read this book, uh, Moringa, Nature's Medicine Cabinet, that you suggested. It's a very good book. It's easy to read, and it's very informative, and it has great recipes great in recipes here. Great recipes in there. Yeah. Uh, one can shred uh, young leaves, put them in a, a, a soup, uh, and there are a lot of benefits to eating the fresh young leaves, which are very high in vitamin C, with the powder, which is very high in everything else, especially iron, because the vitamin C fosters the intake of, of the iron. So for the nutritional value, it's, it's the powder. Uh, okay. In our program in Tanzania, we are teaching the villagers, and we have a trainer who's actually putting them into the Moringa business. So as they're picking the leaves <laughs> and feeding them to their children, uh, they're also learning the business end of it. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so after three years, uh, they'll have mature trees. They'll be able to pick the beans. And our trainer is also uh, going to buy the seeds and sell them on the world market. Mm. And also, it's a government-sponsored program so that 10% of the revenue of these uh, activities is put into a savings account, and the organization matches it. Oh, that's wonderful. We have planted, not we, the villagers, <laughs> have planted over 2,000 trees, and that's uh, a great deal of work. Amazing. Uh, in, in what period of time? The over about a calendar year. The first, plant, the first uh, visit of the trainer where he did the planting was in November, and he did subsequent training sessions for pruning and weeding and other necessities uh, in uh, the spring and the summer. And in the fall, around uh, end of November, December, will be the first crop. The first crop is, is very modest, but uh, after two or three years, it really accelerates. Mm -hmm. And the villagers ha just have to keep faith un until then. Okay. I, and j just to, to let people know, too, that um, I've actually grown uh, moringa trees, a, a few of them, and they're very easy to, easy to grow. All you actually really do need is water, soil, and, and sun, um, and they grow quite easily, and you can do them indoors. I know that they're usually tropical. You have to grow them 
um, outdoors where there's you know a lot of sun um, up here you couldn't really grow them outdoors but you can grow them um, indoors and they can grow up to five feet and you can actually get flowers and those pods so yeah. it can be grown in indoors you sort of have to make a decision early on if you want to maximize the leaf production or the bean production because the pruning is different and the planting is a, is a little bit different uh, that's good to know. But you can get yeah. you can get both. Mm -hmm. Okay, most people would grow it as a small bush for the for the leaves, pick the leaves and, and dry them out. Okay. Is there anything more that you'd like to say about the moringa tree or the project that you're doing? Well, uh, the project in Tanzania uh, is the most challenging one. Yeah, uh, we will have another NGO come in that specializes in developing the management system that supports the water uh, facility. It's called a CAUSO, Community Owned Water Supply Organization. And they work with the villagers and put in writing everything that's going to happen, okay? We write the technical part of the procedures, the maintenance and operations, but a uh, collection of money Mm -hmm. You know, it costs 10 shillings, excuse me, about 100 shillings for each, uh, I think, 100 liters, okay? And someone has to collect the money. Someone has to do the maintenance. Someone has to keep the accounts. And we work with another organization that specializes in, in just that, okay? Uh, we raise the money. It's LVIA. It's an Italian organization. And uh, they're in Tanzania, and we learned about them. And they specialize in CAUSOs. And we bring them in, and they uh, create this constitution. And we make it very clear over and over that they own this system, mm -hmm. OK? They help build it. They help fund it. They develop the plans with us, OK? And here's the rule book. And then we come back and make sure that it's working. And sometimes it isn't working. We have to double our efforts and solve the problems. And uh, it's an ongoing project. Ongoing, <laughs> ongoing project. It's, it's been quite an experience. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the time that you've taken. You know, make us more knowledgeable about this project about water purification, about the many benefits of the, the Moringa tree. So well, again, thank you for the thank opportunity. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so stay tuned for part two of the sustainable living. We will be learning more about food, water, housing, economics, all right here on your local TV station, ACMI-TV. See you soon. <laughs>